Hi everyone, welcome to another A Healthy New Zealand podcast. Today I've got great pleasure in introducing you to Brian Sanders. Brian is a man of many talents. Mm -hmm. He is the host of Peak Human podcast where he interviews experts in nutrition and health related fields and personally I think this is one of the best nutrition podcasts out there so I um, suggest everyone go and have a listen. Um, Brian's an excellent interviewer and I think that means he's able to ask really great questions Um, so I highly recommend you check him out. He also has a website called Sapien, where he offers diet and lifestyle programs based on human e- evolution, ancestral traditions, and modern science. And very excitingly, he is the creator of Food Lies, a film about what humans are supposed to eat. So this film looks at where we went wrong in the last 60 years and how to fix it. So I'll let Brian tell you a bit more about those things. So. Welcome, Brian. Thanks for coming along. Really appreciate it. Thanks, Susan. Yeah, thanks for having me on. And I'd, I'd love to talk about all this stuff. My life's work is spreading this information. <laughs> That's great. Oh, well, I'll let you take it away. Tell us how you got into health coaching and, and about these projects you've got going. Sure. Yeah, I have my own kind of health journey, although I was never you know, obese. So I don't have this dramatic health journey, but I think it was dramatic because I was supposedly this healthy guy and, you know, I, I thought I was doing great and just eating healthy foods. And I realized I was having all these problems and I didn't know it. So I think it's really important. That's part of my journey is it's, I, I feel like there's millions and millions of people out there who aren't realizing their full potential are sick and they don't know it or sick and they do know it and they don't know why. Right. And it's because of their diet and lifestyle are wrong. We've been told the wrong things. And so once I made some simple changes, I got into ancestral health. I read a bunch of books, watched lectures, you know, listened to podcasts, did a million things, did a few things that changed my life. I dropped four pant sizes. Like I was like the in shape guy, but I still dropped four pant sizes, you know? That's so amazing. that kind of woke me yeah. up. I was like, yeah, I'm like, uh, no, I, I wasn't healthy back then. I had all these chronic sort of conditions that I just thought were normal, you know, and, and I turned 30 and I'm just like, Oh, this is what happens when you're 30. And then I had, especially my overuse injuries for computer use, you know, I could barely use a computer. It was so inflamed. And then I just stopped eating all, all these grains and sugars and all the inflammation went away and I could use the computer again, even though it was, you know, debilitating injury that caused me to quit my job as a mechanical engineer that uh, that's, you know, how I started, I was, you know, I went to UCLA, grew up in Hawaii, went to UCLA, did a lot of mechanical engineering work and had to quit because I, it was so bad. So that's part of it. Part of my parents too. We, we ate the supposed healthy diet. We followed the food pyramid. We didn't go out to eat. We were making all our own food, right? We went out like it was a big treat to go out to eat. We were mainly making our own food. It was all the low fat, this, and, you know, chicken breasts with no skin, like the whole deal. And they both died. It was, my mom is basically gone. She's been unresponsive, Alzheimer's uh, for a year and a half, unresponsive, you know. Uh, my dad died of cancer. So these are these chronic diseases that actually a lot of people don't even connect with diet mm-hmm. and lifestyle. They're just like, oh, you know, it's just genetics and that just happens. And, and, you know, once I got into this world, I realized that that doesn't just happen. Our ancestors didn't just happen to get Alzheimer's and cancer they lived long and dropped dead as they say uh so so that really woke me up and that that got me on this mission and a few years ago i quit my job i I got into tech after mechanical engineering and i started making this film food laws and it's been my full-time thing just doing health coaching i work with a doctor here in la We, we help people reverse chronic disease and get healthy and do the making the film do the podcast and all that other stuff yeah fabulous fabulous story i think you raise a really important point there and that is you know we talk about healthy eating but we're all talking about different things you know and and we and we just use the the terms healthy eating as as sort of an um, Mm all-encompassing understanding as if we're all doing the same thing or if, as, or as if we figured it out, 
And I think a lot of it is a little backwards. And I like to look at all sides of nutrition and, and, you know, don't think there's one way of eating. Like I like to eat, you know, a high fat diet, right? There's a keto diet, but that doesn't mean that everyone does. And it doesn't mean that you want to be keto every day, all day. And it doesn't, you know what I mean? There's, mm. there's these things where, it, it, okay. The problem is it's, it, there's no one size fits all diet, but there's also, I think this idea of there's some diets don't fit anyone, <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah. Like this. Yeah, like so, yeah. That's a good way of putting that actually. Some diets don't fit anyone. Yeah. Mm. And I think the ones that have been pushed on us that actually involve a lot of processed foods, when you look at guidelines around the world, and a lot of them have started in America, but you know, they've gone around the world and they're based on processed foods. They're based on, and a lot of people don't know that these pasta and breads and stuff, they're processed foods. These aren't, these aren't what humans should be eating. And these low fat products are not natural. And that, so I guess I'm trying to say is, yes, we have the wrong idea of what, if, you, if someone says, oh, you know, the average person in the street, oh, healthy eating. Like you said, everyone thinks we know what healthy eating. They're, they're talking about, oh yeah, yeah, I eat, you know, low fat and I eat like turkey breasts and chicken breasts with no skin and I eat salads with no dressing or, you know, vegetable oil, canola oil dressing. And I'm like, that is not healthy eating. It's, it's the opposite. Mm, it's highly toxic and inflammatory, isn't it? You know, especially all those seed oils added to the flour and the sugar. <laughs> that's it. Yeah, that's a killer combo right there. The, the seed oils, yeah. flour, sugar, and oil. Yeah, yeah. And, you know, we're all, so many people are scoffing it down and we're shoving it into our kids too, which is a bit of a, bit of a problem. Absolutely, yeah. So you're quite into ancestral diets. Do you want to talk a little bit about those? Why you think that's important? Yeah, that I think some people uh, try to criticize them. They're like, "Oh, well, our ancestors died at thirty, you know," and they don't understand the whole picture. So first, I, I guess I have to sort of debunk that, right? That our ancestors did not die at thirty. Maybe the average age of death was thirty-five from what we know of, but that's because of a high infant mortality or there's accidents or there's infectious diseases or things that, you know, people die of that we, we don't die of anymore. But so the, what's really important is when we study some other cultures, we can study some modern hunter gatherers and we can see that they lived into their eighties. So we know that people, that humans living as we used to can easily live into their eighties. So we also, uh, have this idea that, yeah, that anything modern is good, <laughs> right? And that anything old was bad and that medications can just save everything. And so ancestral health is, well, that's failed, right? We, we kind of see that failing. We, we know that at least in America, 88% of people are not metabolically well. It's a great study that uh, I can send the link to, but we, we can clearly see things aren't working. We're, we're allowing people to live longer but they're not, they have no quality of life. They're sick. They're sick for the last 20 years of their life. But we have this modern technology to prop them up and keep them going, even though they aren't having a good quality of life at all. And it's miserable. But then if you look at ancestral people who still live like we used to, they are healthy until they die, basically. I interviewed a, a really interesting guy who's a Sami, which is, you know, an native living, you know, type of like an Inuit type person up in Northern in the Arctic circle of, of Sweden and Finland. And his, his dad would, would his grandpa, his grandpa died at 95 the day, no, the week before he died, he did a 20 kilometer ski cross country ski trip to visit, visit his friend in another village and then 20 kilometers back. And then two weeks later, he just died. But this, this guy was eating, you know, a native diet who's eating animal foods, who's eating reindeer, you know, they, they herd reindeer, the Sami people, mm -hmm. and they don't have vegetables. You know, it's very against what we, we think is healthy these days. They, they basically just eat reindeer and fish. And this guy was strong. I mean, imagine, I, I don't think I could do a 20 kilometer cross country ski trip and back in one day. So mm -hmm. that that's kind of like a window into ancestral nutrition it's eating whole foods. It's eating what we had available. It's animal foods are the most 
nutritious part. They're the most bioavailable foods. A lot of people don't really understand that, that the plant foods actually, there's nothing wrong with them per se, but they don't have the same nutrition you, that you can get from the animal foods. Like it's not complete proteins. They're not complete vitamins and minerals. They're not in the fully formed states, but then the animal foods, they are. And so it's, it's just really strange we're demonizing animal foods these days mm. when this is where the most complete and bioavailable nutrition comes from. So that, that's, that's a whole nother topic. Yeah, it's, it, it's an important point, though, because we've got a really strong plant-based advocacy in New Zealand now and a real push against animal foods. And, you know, when people ask me what I think and I say, well, if you only ate plant foods would you get all your nutrition without them being, um, you know, without supplements or having them fortified? And you, you can't, you'd die if, if you only existed on plant foods. And ancestrally, we could not have survived if we only existed on plant foods, could we, you know? Whereas Absolutely, animal, yeah. animal, animal foods, we can survive quite well. Exactly. And people do. There's this whole bunch of crazy carnivores these days, yeah, yeah. these days that eat only meat and they're doing great. And I know a lot of them and they're, they're very healthy. And then you can look, of course, at, you know, Inuit and other Sami people, like we said, but also I've gotten really into talking to some great paleoanthropologists and people who look into the past and for the bulk, the large, large majority of human history, it seems to be pointing to us eating mainly meat, mainly animal foods. We were subsisting on large woolly mammoth and large pre prehistoric like uh, deer and different types of big ruminant, these different un undulates or ruminant animals where we could get a lot of fat and a lot of meat from. And this is the majority of human history. We're talking about three and a half million years. And, the, you know, now we're talking about this plant-based movement. It's like, I don't know, 100 years at the most, 50, 70 years. Mm. You know what I mean? I mean, not even 100. I mean, we didn't even develop supplements so that people could even be vegan until, I don't know, six, 70 years ago. Yeah. So, so for mm. if you look at it on a timeline, it's like, nine, you know, if you're talking about three and a half million years ago, we started the first evidence of eating meat. And we have tons of other evidence. I, I've talked to a lot of great, you know, scientists that publish articles on this and that we were fat hunters. We ate meat. We, we have radioisotope evidence showing that, that our, the early humans and a lot of the Neanderthals too, that were, you know, part of our lineage or, you know, split off from our, our early humans were high level trophic carnivores we were eating mostly animal foods so i'm not saying we have to nowadays but i'm i'm what i'm saying is our bodies changed our guts changed you know and, and most people realize that eating animal foods helps our brains enlarge right we have these huge brains now and it was due to a lot of these animal foods into our diet and then if you look at our gut morphology and our our, our just the way our bodies change we can trace that back to the animal foods we've eaten. So, so I guess, so I'm not saying, yes, yeah, so I'm saying that humans are very well adapted to eat, eating a mostly animal-based diet. Not that you have to, but it's just the opposite of this plant-based agenda that's being pushed on us lately. And our digestive tract as well. I mean, that's great evidence that we evolved to eat animal foods to listen to. Uh, yeah, so talk a bit about the digestive tract. Absolutely. Yeah, there's so there's the expensive tissue hypothesis that talks about how it's very our brain is super energetic, super powerful. We need a lot of energy to go to it. And so and then same thing with our guts that it to to make changes in the body, there needs to be strong evolutionary pressure, right? And there needs to be a reason. And so part of this is that once we started getting the very high nutrient availability and of, of fat and meat and seafood and stuff like that, that it, it gave us more energy to grow our brains. It gave it, you know, and it gave us more nutrition. And then with our guts, it changed the way our guts work. So we, we most people know, we, you know, we started as primates and we were eating a lot of plant foods and we had these giant stomachs and we had longer large intestine where the fermentation take, took place and there's also the cecum where a lot of this 
fermentation, you know, these, these animal, I mean, the plant foods are uh, actually converted into short chain fatty acids. And uh, yeah, so you need that fermentation. So what changes as humans evolved, our stomachs got smaller, our large intestine got smaller, our cecum basically disappeared. It's a like a vestigial appendage at this basically it's not we don't use it and our small intestines got bigger and this was very energetically costly but it was for a purpose because we could we we process we digest the animal foods in this small intestine in the you know the upper part of our digestive tract and that's where we get and it's very animal foods very easy to digest right a lot of people heal their guts and heal a lot of uh gi problems and diseases by just eating animal foods because it's so nutrient dense, bioavailable and easy to digest. And humans are set up for that because we have these longer uh, small intestines, you know, the foregut and then the smaller hindgut, right? And that, so that it's the opposite in the, the gorillas or apes or other primates. You can see that they, they have the opposite because they're needing to digest most of their nutrition from plant foods. So we certainly have a system that is very well equipped and better adapted for animal foods. And another quick thing about that is the uh, stomach, uh, uh, the acidity of our stomach is similar to that. It's just, it's 1.5. So that's very low. You know, other chimps and stuff are around, you know, five, six, like these plant eaters are sick. You know, they're more of a neutral uh, stomach acid pH and we're down at 1.5 which is similar to hyenas, vultures, other scavengers. These are carnivorous scavengers. Mm -hmm. So that also shows you that we spent millions of years. I mean, Homo erectus was around for almost 2 million years and they were scavenging, you know, carcasses. We were eating Mm -hmm. sort of spoiled Mm -hmm. meat and we needed, this is another evolutionary pressure, this strong sort of expensive tissue idea that to develop such a low stomach pH to deal with, these pathogens and you know rotting meat is very expensive and evolution doesn't work uh, the opposite way right we we develop because we need these things that are so important to us so we know and also we just know that's how diets work if you have this low stomach ph that's you know these are the more carnivorous animals and our teeth as well i mean our teeth are also representative of that aren't they Exactly. So, well, some vegans will try to say, oh, well, we don't have giant fangs or, you know, stuff like that. Yeah. But actually, our teeth do show that we, well, for one, they've gotten smaller uh, over the year from, so that means that we, well, that, well, the, really that shows is that we process, humans process food outside the body. We're really interesting. That's basically our thing. We're not very good at hunting mm. by, on our own, but we're good at tool making, right? So we can, we can, and collaborating and hunting in groups and we're smart and we use tools and we process food outside the body and we, we can, you know, cook meat and we can process plant foods to make them more bioavailable and we can ferment, you know, I'm really into fermented foods and, you know, you could get more nutrition from them. And so this, this actually sh- like made our, our teeth shrink because we didn't need them as much as the old days. So yes, we, even though we don't have, Fang, you know, we don't have these giant canines, but that's because we evolved from primates and, you know, carnivores that have those are a completely different lineage. So that, that's sort mm. of a stupid point by plant-based people. Mm. Mm. And so we've evolved to be able to absorb the nutrients from our cooked meat a lot more, haven't we? Um, what sort of, what sort of nutrients are specific to animal foods rather than you know that we don't really get from plant foods or are not so bioavailable from plant foods yeah i mean most of them really (laughs) so there's vitamin b12 is the most well known you can't get vitamin b12 from plant foods pretty much i mean there's some algae you may be able to get some but yeah the plant foods don't have b12 and that's very important and that's what i was referring to is until i've don't remember the year, I don't know, 1940, 1950, we developed a B12 supplement. We, you couldn't be vegan until then. Mm-hmm. So vitamin B12, you the fat soluble vitamins, vitamin A, D, E, and K are all w- way higher in animal foods and or more bioavailable. And even they're in different forms. Like for example, vitamin A, there's a difference between the vitamin A that's in carrots, you know, it's beta carotene compared to vitamin A, like the retinol, 
like the version that is in animal foods and people can't really convert that vitamin A from carrots into usable uh, vitamin A, right? So that it's, yeah. some people are better than others, but that's just one example of, of these fat soluble vitamins for one, they need fat and you know, plant foods usually don't have fat with them. And so if you're not eating fat, you, you can't absorb them. And there's also iron, right? Heme iron is in meat that we need. And a lot of vegans and vegetarians are very deficient in iron. And a lot of females are deficient in iron and it's really important. And uh, yeah, there, there, there's a ton of them. Mm. And what about the plant toxins? Because plants have quite a few anti-nutrients, don't they? So that makes digestion, you know, more difficult for some people. Exactly. So this is one of the most surprising things that I've come across. And I've, I've talked to a lot of great people, by the way. I'm basically trying to, my job, I feel, is a communicator. I'm trying to synthesize all this information from great scientists. And yeah, I've talked to over 150 scientists and doctors about this stuff. So I'm trying to kind of just recap it all. But the, the plant anti-nutrients is surprising because most people, they've been led to believe that these like kale and spinach, like these are superfoods or like acai berries, you know, we all, we got to get these acai berries from the Amazon and we're just going to save the day and your health. And it's, I mean, it's basically like a marketing gimmick for one. It's people trying to sell you their super food smoothies or something, but also it's, it's kind of just where we went wrong and it's tied into a whole, whole environmental, you know, animal rights agenda as well, where, you know, we start demonizing, animal foods mm. but the anti-nutrients in plants are well documented this is easy to find in the literature like oxalates is a great example so spinach and kale have high oxalate and that it, it interferes with calcium absorption and it, and also people are probably familiar with maybe vegans they know that gun uh, kidney stones actually liam hemsworth is famously got a lot of kidney stones so he went vegan and had to stop being vegan because the, these kidney stones are calcium oxalate so the, the oxalate, if you're eating a lot of raw spinach, which I used to do, I mean, I, years ago, I got caught up in this whole like spinach kale shake craze, you know, I was drinking all these shakes and I think it kind of messed me up. I, I, I don't think my health benefited from drinking all these smoothies. And so you know, the kidney stones form from this uh, calcium oxalate. And then there's another example of there's, there's phytates, there's, most people have heard of gluten, right? The gluten yeah. is one. There's lectins. There's there's a million of them. Not a million, but there's a ton of them. And they're in all plant foods. I guess the simple way to explain it is plants don't have a way to defend themselves other than to produce chemicals or, you know, things, compounds in to deter bugs from eating them or whatever from eating them. So this is just a simple truth that, you know, animals can run away. So they don't have all these toxins in them and we, in the plants do. And so, yeah, there is a lot of, even I, I haven't came across a vegan website talking about all the problems with uh, oxalates or different anti-nutrients. So, you know, they warn vegans like, Hey, you know, you got to watch out. There's this, there's that lectins, you know, and bean, you have to like soak the beans. So I'll go back to, we started talking about humans, preparing food right we're doing these preparation techniques outside the body and that make them more bioavailable so people will say oh well what about all these people who are healthy who are eating plant foods for many parts all parts of history or other parts of the world well they actually use a lot of these techniques to lower the anti-nutrients so there are techniques to do this fermenting is one of them so if you ferment something it gets rid of a lot of the bad things <laughs> in them or you can in beans you can cook you soak them or you use a pressure cooker and you get out the anti-nutrients you get out the lectins you there's tons of different techniques there's a great guy dr bill schindler he even went to south america and and interviewed and lived with all these tribes and they were potatoes they were finding out ways to get there's actually anti-nutrients in potatoes and they would ferment them for a long time or they there's something called nixtamalization where these people would even eat it with a clay and they would dip the potatoes into clay and then eat the yeah. potatoes with this clay because the clay they didn't know it but the clay bounds to the different anti-nutrients and blocked absorption to the body so humans are super 
they're they're super smart and they it's a lot of trial and error and we did a lot of things over millions of years of evolution and figured them out and so yeah that's that's the whole plant anti-nutrient thing so a lot of people uh, may have trouble with them and not know why or what's going on and then when they stop eating them they'll find they feel better or their you know certain conditions will go away and that, that was a little bit of my story of my chronic overuse injuries from using the computer and I believe it was from the inflammation from grains even though I was never gluten intolerant I have no problem with gluten that I knew of and I don't have any like stomach problems or anything eating them but I think that they cause this inflammation that you don't even know about and then when I stopped eating them and I guess sugars I eating eating less sugars and grains both sort of this inflammatory pathways it it went away, right? My wrist pain and hand mm-hmm. pain went away. So that's my, <laughs> that's my story. <laughs> I think it's hard for people to make the connection. I think what you said earlier, you know, where you think, oh, I'm just getting older. This is how it's, this is how it's going to be. It's not really connected to my food. But, and again, you said earlier, you know, it's such a huge loss of potential. You spend so much time worrying about and looking after your health and all your conditions rather than, living your life to its fullest potential exactly well and especially yeah like as you age it can be even worse and and i mean there's this idea of how hard it is to cure something than how much easier it is to prevent something Mm. right so yeah that that's a great message you kind of bring up is that we should be focusing on what we eat realizing that what you eat is affecting you so much it's so important and then eating better making these changes so that you don't get these chronic diseases later in life. And obviously you'll be a lot happier. You'll live longer and, you know, you won't have to go through the money and, you know, inconvenience and all the other stuff down Mm. the road. And I think we're in a time of real um, digestive issues too. You know, everybody's got gut issues. Everyone's talking about their microbiome, bloating, you know, um, SIBO or you know these various conditions and the way we treat them you know the way you would treat them or I treat them is we remove plant foods from the diet don't we you know yes and that's really hard to digest uh, to use a pun there it's uh (laughs) you know like I actually went on a little trip recently and hung out with a nice young lady who had SIBO and she, and she was just got the wrong information and was like, Oh, you know, I've got to eat my plant foods and I got to get, I get these like low, you know, she, she was, she was like halfway there. Some doctors for one, will just try to give a medication for it and not even know about diet. And then there's a next level of people who maybe know a little bit about how the gut actually works and would, you know, rec- make some changes, but they still have this idea like, Oh, well, red meat and fat is bad. So you, you can't do that. So, you know, eat chicken breasts and we'll do like all, all these different vegetables that maybe have lower FODMAPs or, you know, the, the, they'll try to do some, something. And then there's sort of the next level of people that you're, you're kind of talking about and, you know, more in this animal-based nutrition, ancestral nutrition world that have amazing, amazing success just saying, hey, let's just get rid of the plants altogether and let the gut heal. And you can get everything you need from these animal foods, especially if you're eating nose to tail, you know, you're eating liver and the organs and you're eating oysters and, you know, all kinds of seafoods and different, you know, eggs and you're, you're fine. So yeah, you're right. It, that's, that's a great way to heal the gut. Mm. And heal everything else as well. And we don't really need to be worrying about fat, you know, saturated fat and cholesterol and heart disease. I mean, that's another myth that needs well, it has been put to bed now. I mean, there's more and more information coming out. Well, yeah. There's actually a big study in the American Journal of Cardiology. You know, this is the most well-respected cardiology journal. It was actually only two weeks ago. Uh, maybe it's two and a half by now. But it, it says, hey, we have no evidence to say that we need to limit saturated fat. So this is what a lot of people in our community have known for decades, that that we had it wrong, that these low fat guidelines were wrong, low cholesterol guidelines are wrong. But now we're finally catching up with the science. And I mean, there's a whole 
other story of, you know, food industries getting involved and bigger interests and money and all this type of stuff of mm-hmm. why this information is not being told because it's, it's pretty plain to see that there's nothing wrong with saturated fat. There's nothing wrong with eating cholesterol. Like eating an egg is one of the most nutritious foods you can eat. And we've been eating eggs forever since we, we can, we, before we even have records of, I mean, it's obvious that a human would grab an egg and eat it and eggs are, you know, they have high cholesterol, but they're example of how perfect nutrition can be because what is an egg? It's something that can make an entire animal. It has all the nutrients that the animal needs to create itself, I guess you could say. And it's something we've been demonizing. So if you kind of look at it from that perspective, we're kind of getting into the, the film territory. Well, everything I'm talking about is kind of part of this food lies film that I'm creating. Yeah. But Do you want to the, tell us a bit about the film then and what you're doing? Yeah, absolutely. So it's just part of it is how wrong we got it. And that I'm kind of saying is we, we have these ideas of, oh, you know, we're going to eat the low fat yogurt and the, the low fat milk and this stuff. That doesn't make any sense. Like part of the goal of the film is to teach people about what true nutrition is. And it's not what a food company has decided it is. And a lot of people don't realize that a lot of the studies that have been done in the last 60, 70 years are funded by pharmaceutical and food industries, right? And, and a lot of, and they, of course, they want to fund it because they're making money off this stuff. They're making money off processed foods. And you, you, there's no money in, in whole foods. I actually have a grass-fed, grass-finished meat business. And I, don't, I barely make any money because it all goes to the raising of the animals. You know what mm. I mean? And, and so yeah. it's like, I, I acutely am aware that you don't make money in whole foods. But if I decided to have some processed food type of thing, like maybe I made like some keto product, for example, I mean, I can make a lot more money. Right. I, and mm. I could just package up, even if it is, you know, healthy, it's like, Oh, this is a keto bar. You know, it has coconut oil and yeah, maybe those are fine actually, you know, be, once in a while, if you want to treat, but uh, just, it's a good example of, you know, what happens in the world is pe- people can make a lot more money on the processed foods and that money drives everything. So that's a big theme of the film is looking at where this came from where these ideas came from. I mean, there's a history, you know, there's like a whole story of Ansel Keys and, you know, where the science went wrong, but it's also what's driving it. And it's, it's very obvious that it is the financial interest. And so another goal of the film is just try to let people know why we got to this place. Cause that's mm-hmm. the confusing, right? Because that's like, they're like, yeah, but how come every doctor I've ever heard is telling me to mm-hmm. eat lean chicken and vegetables. Mm-hmm. And that's, you know, and, and so you, you really need to understand why. And I hope a lot of the stuff I've been saying so far helps people to kind of understand why, you know, it's like, there's a lot of bad science. There's a lot of accidents kind of, you could say, you know, or misfortunate circumstances. There's a lot of money and we've gotten to this point. And so it, it all makes sense. And we just need to figure out how to undo it. Mm. Right. So people, just to remind people, you have done, as you said, hundreds of interviews with experts across all fields around nutrition. And I really recommend they go and check out your podcast and pick up on some of those. And that will be one of the best ways of learning more about, you know, the topics we're just like really briefly touching on today. Yeah. Yeah. So I have 91 podcasts so far and I try to keep them very, you know, very high quality, really good guests. And it's kind of like a preview of the movie. If you listen to them all, a lot of people do, they go back and they listen to every single one of them and they message me how they've changed their life and they got their your family on it and their kids are on it even, and everyone's on board and they're doing amazing. But yeah, it, I, I decided a couple of years ago when I started making the film to go inter- as long as I'm going to interview them for, for the film, I might as well do a podcast with them and go, go deep dive and do, you know, an hour and a half podcast and get the, the real info. So yeah, actually, so I'll, I'll quickly recap the film too. So just to, you know, give people an idea, we're going from the, the ancient history of humans. We're starting with the very early evolution. Like let's go through and, and linearly kind of go through this story and what should humans eat? All the stuff I've been talking about today. How did we evolve? Then we go to when did we start demonizing red meat? Like, why did we even think it was bad? And we go into the, you know, 
that was around 1880s. And then we got into the 19th turn of the century. We started getting these vegetable oils and all these uh, other things started happening. We had bad science in the 1940s, 50s. We had these bad guidelines in the 1980s that when obesity really took off was in, when America introduced the 1980 dietary guidelines. And uh, we, so yes, we, we go through the whole story. We look at the, what, where we went wrong. And then we get into the more modern day, the last 20 years, we've done a lot of good science to show how we were wrong. So a lot of people don't know that there's gr tons of great science proving everything that I've been saying. And that just no one talks about it. No one reports on it. That, that study that exonerated saturated fat and saying that it's not bad that came out two and a half weeks ago. No media outlets mm -hmm. picked it up. No one I picked it up. No one talked about it. No I, one posted at all. A, I posted a link to that on my Facebook page um, a few days ago, but yeah, you know, I mean, th these are really important studies that we need to be really need to be addressing. But if there's an anti-meat study, and, epidemiological study that comes up in cancer hits the headlines around the world you know that's the sad part yeah i mean there is this narrative 